everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics by N. Gregory Mankiw. We're going to be working with the sixth edition, and we are going to be doing chapter five, problem number two. The problem starts by saying, suppose that business travelers and vacationers have the following demand for airline tickets from New York to Boston. And then it gives the following demand schedules, both for business travelers and for vacation travelers. So you can think about, for each of these, if you wanted to, you could plot a demand curve for business travelers by plotting these prices versus these quantities. And we could also make a demand curve for vacation travelers by just plotting these prices versus these quantities here. So part A of the problem asks, as the price of tickets rises from $200 to $250, what is the price elasticity of demand for business travelers? And then it asks, what is the price elasticity of demand for vacation travelers? And it also asks us to use what we call the midpoint method, or in some texts it's called arc elasticity as opposed to point elasticity in our calculations. So we want to think about how to do that as well. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to think about our elasticity formula and make sure that we're clear on what's going on there. So in general, we say that the price elasticity of demand measures how responsive quantity demanded is to price. In general, you can think about elasticity in a very literal sense. You know, if you're thinking about a rubber band, a rubber band that's very elastic, you put a force on it and it stretches a lot. A rubber band that's not very elastic, you put that same amount of force and it just stretches a little bit. In the same way, demand that's very elastic, you put a force, that being a particular percentage change in price, and you get a lot of response. You get a lot of percentage change in quantity demanded. And if your demand is very inelastic, you put that same force, you put that same percentage change in price, and you just get a little change, or a little percent change in quantity demanded. The formula, the basic formula we think about for price elasticity of demand is the following. We say price elasticity of demand, usually referred to as little e sub d, is just the percent change in quantity demanded divided by the percent change in price. So price elasticity of demand essentially answers the question, what percent change in quantity demanded do we get in response to a 1% increase in price? Now, You've probably noticed by now that demand curves slope downwards. So quantity demanded and price are always going to be moving in opposite directions. What that means for elasticity is we're always going to have a ratio of either a negative number to a positive number, where we'd have a decrease in quantity demanded and an increase in price, or a positive number and a negative number. So you'd have an increase in quantity demanded and a decrease in price. So what some textbooks do is they say, well, let's just simplify this. We know that technically speaking, we're always going to get a negative number out of this formula. Let's just report the positive part. Let's just report the absolute value. So depending on what textbook you're using, you may or may not do this last step here. But that's going to be a really small part of what we're doing overall. So the other thing that we wanted to think about here is we were told to use this mysterious midpoint method, which if we write down the formula, looks pretty freaking scary. You know, I could literally write it down and we'd get something like that this, if we're using the midpoint method, is equal to the quantity demanded new minus the quantity demanded old over the quantity demanded new plus the quantity demanded old over two. Gotta have some parentheses here. This is gonna be all over a price that's new minus a price that's old, all divided by the new price plus the old price, divided by two. Put some parentheses there, finish off our absolute value. And this is what we're looking to do. It's kind of overwhelming, and I'm actually half surprised that I remembered it. 
But if you think about what we're doing, this is really only a small modification on this. Because let's think about what our elasticity formula is actually saying. Because if we're thinking about percent change, well, percent change is just final minus initial divided by initial times 100%. That's just what we learned in our high school math or something. So what we would say here is that this basic formula is just the new, sorry about that, the new quantity demanded minus the old quantity demanded over the old quantity demanded times 100%, and that's your percent change in quantity demanded, right? And then we would do the same thing for percent change in price, so this would just be the new price minus the old price divided by the old price times 100%. And notice that because we're multiplying by 100% in both the top and the bottom, those guys just cancel out. And then what we're left with is this. So we can compare what we're doing in our basic formula to what we're doing in the midpoint method, and it's actually not that different. Because in both cases, you have new quantity demanded minus old quantity demanded. You've got that here, and you've got that here. In both cases, you've got the new price minus the old price. You've got that here and here. The difference is that when we're using the midpoint method, rather than dividing by the old quantity and the old price, as our strict percent change formula tells us to do, we're dividing by the average of the new and the old price. So that's really what this means, right? That the new quantity demanded plus the old quantity demanded divided by two is just the average of the old and new quantity. So if you think about it that way, this is actually just a minor change on our formula here. So it's not anything to be particularly intimidated by. So all we have to do now is go through the formula and plug in the numbers that were requested. So let's work out some calculations here. We'll do business travelers first. And just as a reminder, the question asked for us to look at elasticity as we're going from a price of 200 to a price of 250. And one thing that's interesting to note is that this is a pretty big jump in price, right? That strictly speaking, using our percent change formula, this is a 25% increase in price. And as we consider larger percent changes in price, that's when the midpoint formula becomes more relevant. So it's not surprising that when we were looking at this pretty discrete change in price that we were told to use the midpoint method. So we can do that here. That we can just say, well, let's think about the change in quantity. And this is just going to be, you know, start with our absolute value. Our new quantity minus our old quantity Let's be careful. Let's be careful with our sign to make sure we're not screwing up which one is the old and which one is the new, because that becomes really important if we're not taking the absolute value at the end. So if we're going, we're increasing in price, then this quantity here is the new quantity, and this one is the old one. So in that sense, we're going to get 1,900 minus 2,000 divided by the average of 1900 and 2000, which is 1950. So right there, we're you know halfway to our formula. And then we think about the change in price. Well, our new price is 250. Our old price was 200. And we're gonna divide by the average of 250 and 200 which is 225. So all we have to do is we have to figure out what this is, right? There's a little bit more we can do before we have to resort to our trusty calculator. 1900 minus 2000 is just negative 100 divided by 1950. 250 minus 200 is just 50 divided by 225. And then we can pick up our calculator. Or we could do this. We could cancel things out and do this all in fractions. But either way is fine. So we can say, for example, 
picking up the calculator and say negative 100 divided by 1950 and I get about 0 0.05128. And if you're going to do this, if you're going to take the decimal approximations, Make sure you have a decent number of decimal points so that your final answer isn't susceptible to too much rounding error. So I would do something like this. And then for the bottom, I have 50 divided by 225, which is just 0 0.22222, repeating, and so on and so forth. Technically, this is negative because we started with a negative. And then I could just divide these two numbers and say, got 0 0.05128 divided by 0.22222, negative, which gives me the absolute value of negative 0 0.23. So if I'm reporting the absolute value, I can say that this is about 0 0.23. If your particular text, your particular course prefers you to just put the negative number, you would report negative 0 0.23. All right, now that I reclaimed and reorganized some board real estate over here, we're ready to think about the elasticity of demand for vacation travelers. And we're just going to do the same thing over again so we get some good practice here. So for vacation travelers, we notice, again, the price is going from 200 to 250 but now our quantity demanded is going from 800 to 600. So those are the numbers that we need to plug in. So we start off and we say, well, okay, we're just gonna plug into this formula. We can start with our absolute value. Maybe we can be fancy and say elasticity of demand equals the absolute value of the new quantity minus the old quantity. So again, remember, because we're going from here to here, these numbers are the new values and these numbers are the old ones. And it's interesting, when we're using the midpoint method, that actually doesn't matter because we're gonna get the same answer either way. But we still wanna be consistent with the formula, even though the whole point of the midpoint method is that the number going from a price of 250 to a price of 200 would be exactly the same. So we've got new quantity demanded, old quantity demanded, that's just gonna be 600 minus 800 and then we divide that by the average of 600 and 800, which is just 700. Let's put that there. And then we have, again, our change in price, which is actually going to be the same thing that we had in the last formula. So the only thing that's changing is the top, because both business travelers and vacation travelers were subjected to the same change in price. So this is just going to be, again, 250, which is the new price minus 200 over the average of 250 and 200, which is 225. So again, we can simplify as much as is easy to do without a calculator. And we could just say that this one on the top is negative 200 over 700. And on the bottom, again, we have 50 over 225. And we could put this into our calculator at this point. You could also notice that this is just negative 2 divided by 7. Make it a little bit easier. But in any case, again, back to the trusty calculator here. So we could say negative 2 over 7 is about negative 0.28571. Again, give yourself a lot of room with decimal places. And we said before that 50 divided by 225 is just 0.2 repeating. So this would be 0.22222. So we could do that. We could say that this comes out to the absolute value of negative 1.29, just rounding to two decimal places. I don't have a particular reason to do that. It seemed like a good answer. And that's consistent with what I did for the business travelers, which is equal to 
1.29. So now we have that calculation here, and we're now ready to compare the two numbers. That we got an elasticity of demand of 0 0.23 for business travelers and an elasticity of 1.29 for vacation travelers. So let's think about what that means. So again, to summarize the situation and clean up the board a little bit, we got an elasticity of demand of 0.23 for business travelers and an elasticity of 1.29 for vacation travelers. And we could say, based on this, we tend to categorize elasticity of demand based on whether it's bigger or smaller than one in magnitude or in absolute value, right? So here we would say that because this elasticity number is less than one, that this particular demand is inelastic. And because this elasticity of demand here is greater than one, that this d demand is elastic. So we think about one being that tipping point. If the elasticity of demand were exactly one, we would say that it had unit elasticity. Now, part B of the question asks us to examine why the business and vacation travelers might have different elasticity of demand. And we can see here that we know that they do just because we were told that they do, because we were given these numbers. But we can think about why that might make sense based on the general rules that we know about elasticity. So if we're going to think about what tends to make things more or less elastic, one thing that you notice is that necessities tends to have lower price elasticity of demand than luxuries. And it may very well be the case that for the business traveler, they don't really have a choice of whether they go to meet a client, it's a big deal if they miss that meeting, that this trip is seen as more of a necessity than this vacation trip over here. Especially said that this, we said that this person was a vacation traveler, they're not going to like their grandmother's funeral or something like that. It's likely that they're viewing this as a luxury over here. And if luxuries tends to have more elastic demand than necessities, it's not surprising that we would see this. We could also think about some of the other determinants of elasticity. And we could notice, for example, that we can say elasticity tends to be higher or customers tend to be more price elastic with goods that are the, a larger share of their budget. And it may be the case that the vacation for the vacation traveler is a larger share of the vacationer's budget than the business trip is a share of budget for the company. So again, that'd be consistent with what we see here, that the larger share of budget would be correspond to the larger elasticity, and the smaller share of budget would correspond to the lower elasticity. You could even think about a third reason, which is a little bit outside the scope of, technically speaking, the textbook material. But we even get into issues of the what economists would call the agency problem or some misalignment of incentives. Because it might be the case that this business traveler is making decisions for his or her own travel, but they're not the ones stuck with the bill. And as soon as you get the person who's making the decision not being the one who bears the costs, hey, if I'm not spending my own money, I'm not going to be particularly price sensitive. So that actually might be a third reason why we might see lower elasticity or lower price sensitivity for the business traveler than for the person who's presumably paying for their own vacation. 